Hello, thank you for watching. This is my lecture on books 7 through 12 of The Odyssey by Homer. Uh, and again, this is Professor Ryan St. Paul of AM University, Kingsville. Book 10, The Bewitching Queen of Aea. So after leaving the island of the Cyclops, uh, Odysseus and his men arrive at the kingdom of Aeolus. And it's described as a great floating island it was, and round it all huge ramparts rise of indestructible bronze and sheer rock cliffs shoot up from sea to sky. The king had sired twelve children within his halls, six daughters and six sons in the lusty prime of youth. So he gave his daughters as wives to his six sons. Seated beside their dear father and doting mother, with delicacies aplenty spread before them, they feast on forever. So we have another um, example of royal incest. Um, and we might think about what this is, not as a literal description, but metaphorically, what does it mean to have everything stay within the family? If we think about how in ancient cultures, marriage was not just about love, but was about creating bonds between one society or one tribe and another through the bonds of marriage, through exchanging daughters and sons. What does it say about a civilization or a city, a culture, if they don't engage in that kind of outward oriented marriage and um, uh, seeking of bonds and engagements? and interactions um, and compare think about the ramparts of ind indestructible bronze as a metaphorical um, representation of the incestuous inward nature of the marriages in this family as well how does the physical description of the land match the marital status of their nobility we learn that aeolus um, is the master of the winds. Zeus has given him control of the winds. And so he gives Odysseus a, a sack made of ox skin that has all the winds in it. So Odysseus can pull out a wind whenever he needs it in order to have his, uh, help his ship as he sails home. But his crew are a bit jealous. Again, this repeated theme of Odysseus's crew causing him problems. They think Heaps of, plund of lovely plunder he hauls home from Troy, while we who went through slogging just as hard, we go home empty-handed. Now this Aeolus loads him down with treasure, favoritism, friend to friend. Hurry, let's see what loot is in that sack, how much gold and silver. Break it open now. Um, are the crew honest? Is this correct what they say, that they're not, that they never get anything from Odysseus? Keep in mind the way Odysseus discusses what he says whenever he kills something or whenever they serve food or whenever they make sacrifices and how he makes a point to say everyone got some of this. So thinking about, um, you know, can we trust Odysseus? Is he being truthful when he says that? Or were his men just being jealous unnecessarily? Were they just being greedy? What do you think? So, of course, opening up something that you're not supposed to, as we learned from the story of Pandora, always causes problems. So the men open up the sack, the winds uh, all burst out, and the, ship is, the ships are cast back to Aeolus' kingdom. Um, when they see Odysseus walking back into their palace, though, they're not happy about it. They say, uh-oh, this guy must be cursed. And the king says, away from my island fast, most cursed man alive. It's a crime to host a man or speed him on his way when the blessed deathless gods despise him so. Crawling back like this, it proves the immortal hate, immortals hate you. So Odysseus is cast out. Um, one of the uh, first examples of a, another human uh, being less than hospitable. But Aeolus has his reasons. It seems like Odysseus is cursed. We get then the brief story of the Lestragonians, which is sort of a mini echo of what happened on the uh, island of the Cyclops. It's another island of giants. Um, their king kills and eats one of Odysseus's men. And when the giants attack, Odysseus and his men flee. So this is perhaps a story that was added in, um, given that it seems to be basically just a, a, a less interesting repeat of what happened on the island of Polyphemus. Um, uh, or perhaps just another, you know, mini narrative to flesh out the story, to fill up space, to give a little bit more adventure to Odysseus's travels. And after the Lestragonians, 
they arrive at the island of Circe, who is, like Calypso, a divine nymph. And Odysseus goes out and finds a great stag and kills it and, and gives uh, food to his men to raise their spirits. Notice how he says, everyone got some. I made sure everyone was included. And then he sends his men out to search the island, led by Eurylochus, who, as we'll see, continues to cause problems for Odysseus uh, throughout the next couple of books. And they come to Circe's palace, and we're given a glimpse of the magic and the power of Circe. Mountain wolves and lions were roaming round the grounds. She'd bewitched them herself. She gave them magic drugs. But they wouldn't attack my men. And then his men paused at her doors, the nymph with lovely braids, Circe, and deep inside they heard her singing, lifting her spellbinding voice as she glided back and forth at her great immortal loom, her enchanting web, a shimmering glory, only goddesses can weave. So we might think about who else have we seen weaving in this poem and what does weaving mean? And also think about the voice, Cer Circe's voice and why that is so important and spellbinding. Whereas on a few of Odysseus's more recent um, adventures, we'd seen a lack of hospitality, people who are inhospitable, Circe is all too hospitable. She mixes a potion for them, a bowl of wine, but puts uh, a magic uh, element in there. Once they drained the bowls she filled, suddenly she struck with her wand, drove them into her pigsties, all of them bristling into swine with grunts, snouts, even their bodies, yes, and only the men's minds stayed steadfast as before. So off they went to their pens, sobbing, squealing. So she turns them all into pigs. Um, and we might think about, again, me uh, metaphorically, what is happening here. This idea of, of feeding them, but then turning them into swine. What is appropriate poetically about turning these men into pigs? What does that say about them? Is this revealing something about their nature? Odysseus then sets out after Eurylochus, the only survivor, um, comes back and Odysseus sets out to find his men and he comes across a young man who he somehow knows is the god Hermes in disguise. And Hermes warns him that Circe is magic and will try to transform him and gives him an herb to protect Odysseus from Circe's enchantment. enchantment. Its root is black and its flower white as milk and the gods call it moly. Dangerous for a mortal man to pluck from the soil, but not for deathless gods. So here we see the gods helping Odysseus, despite some of their previous punishment and torment. When Odysseus arrives, of course, Circe tries to enchant him, but it doesn't work. And she realizes that it's Odysseus because, again, another repeated theme, it's been prophesied that a man named Odysseus would come and would resist her magic. And so she says, you have a mind and you no magic can enchant. You must be Odysseus, man of twists and turns. Come, sheathe your sword. Let's go, let's go to bed together. Mount my bed and mix in the magic work of love. We'll breed deep trust between us. So she's instantly um, lustful after Odysseus. And not to put too fine a point on it, but we might think about the image of sheathing one's sword um, in the context of a sexual invitation. And Odysseus says, well, wait a minute, I'm not going to sleep with you until you promise not to try to trick me, not to try to transform me or harm me. And so she agrees and Odysseus then goes to her bed. Um, just as a point, we might think about how Penelope is praised for her uh, uh, nobility and her resistance to the suitors. Odysseus is never condemned, even though he sleeps with a lot of women on his way back home. And Odysseus, after he has mounted her bed, uh, convinces Circe to release the rest of his men from her spell. And she does so and says, but look, wait here. You guys have suffered a lot. Let me help you to restore your strength. So the Ithacans, they rest on her island for a year, a full year. But finally, the sailors, the crewmen say to Odysseus, look, we've been here too long. Captain, this is madness. 
High time you thought of your own home at last, if it really is your fate to make it back alive and reach your well-built house and native land. So strikingly, Odysseus, despite his stated desire to return home, needs to be reminded of uh, reminded that his wife is waiting for him. So even though Circe doesn't literally enchant him, we might think again, metaphorically speaking, he has been enchanted in some way because he seems to be content to stay on her island for however long. So Odysseus tells Circe that they plan to leave, but she says, look, before you go, you need to go to the underworld. You need to go to the land of the dead and you have to speak with Tiresias, who is a legendary blind prophet of the city of Thebes. You need to speak with him and he will tell you what you need to do in order to get home. So questions about book 10. Um, to repeat what I said earlier, what does the incestuous nature of the Aeolian royal family, as well as the presence of incest in many Greek myths, um, what does it suggest about their civilization and their relationship to outsiders? Again, thinking about marriage not so much as about love, but marriage as a political and economic and social institution. What might be metaphorically suggested when we see a society where the royal family do not go outside of their own, their own family? They don't marry outside of their family. Um, in this book, as, in, as we've seen, we have this developing theme of Odysseus in conflict with his men. They repeatedly disagree with him and even oppose him. Sometimes they do so wrongly out of greed, it seems, but other times they seem to give him pretty good advice. So what is the difference? What makes a difference between when they give him good advice or bad advice, if there is any difference? Um, and what do you make of this repeated theme? What does this interaction suggest about Odysseus? about his character, about what it means to be a leader, about the difficulties of leadership. And what ideas are represented or expressed in the character of Circe and her power to transform men into animals? How does she compare with the other prominent women that we've seen in the poem, both human and divine? And think about again, what we can learn about Greek ideas of gender from looking at these relationships. Book 11, The Kingdom of the Dead. Odysseus travels to the edge of the ocean. It's not, again, exactly clear where this is, um, but he travels to some far off place, although not very far from Circe's island, apparently. And he finds there the entrance to Erebus, the kingdom of the dead. And he makes a number of sacrifices in order to draw the dead out. And again, mainly Tiresias, who he's looking for. And so the ghosts start to emerge. And up out of Erebus they came, flocking toward me now, the ghosts of the dead and gone, brides and unwed, unwed youths, and old men who had suffered much, and girls with their tender hearts freshly scarred by sorrow, and great armies of battle dead, stabbed by bronze spears, men of war still wrapped in bloody armor, thousands swarming around the trench from every side, unearthly cries, blanching terror gripped me. So it's a rather poignant moment as we see all the dead, um, young people, old men, poor girls who have, uh, were tortured by their lost love. And of course, most powerfully for Odysseus, all the many thousands who have died in war. So the ghost of Tiresias comes and he tells Odysseus um, about what's going to happen to him. He says, Poseidon is angry. You blinded his son. And so this you're going to have a difficult time getting home. And he says, you need to go to the island of Thrinacia, but don't eat any of the cattle, any of the livestock there. They are all the cattle of Helios, the sun god. So you cannot kill them or else he will punish you. And he says, but even if you do, even if you, you get by them without killing them, or even if um, uh, you escape the punishment that the God gives to your men for killing his livestock. Even if you escape, you'll come home late and come a broken man. 
again, that repeated idea of him being a broken man. All shipmates lost, alone in a stranger ship, and you will find a world of pain at home. Crude, arrogant men devouring all your goods, courting your noble wife, offering gifts to win her. So a grim outlook for Odysseus. We have another very poignant, painful moment when Odysseus sees the ghost of his mother, who he, of course, had not known that she had died since he hasn't been home for 20 years. And he speaks with her and learns how she died and of his father, who still lives, his father's unending grief. It was my longing for you, my shining Odysseus, you and your quickness, you and your gentle ways that tore away my life that had been sweet. And I, my mind in turmoil, how I long to embrace my mother's spirit, dead as she was. Three times I rushed toward her, desperate to hold her. Three times she fluttered through my fingers, sifting away like a shadow, dissolving like a dream. And each time the grief cut to the heart, sharper. So it's a very painful moment where we see Odysseus realizing just what he's lost in going off to war and pursuing his heroic ideals. He's lost his mother, and now he can't even give her one last hug. He cannot embrace his mother one last time. He can only see her ghost and know that she died suffering for him, missing him. So it's a really poignant, powerful moment um, that shows, I think, just how brilliant Homer was in that he could present the heroism of Odysseus while at the same time show the dark side of the heroic ideal, show the costs of his culture's values and what was lost when one lived only for war. Odysseus sees a number of other famous dead, some of whom he speaks with, and as you'll see, each of them connects in some way to some other story, some uh, to the larger world of Greek myth. So it's a moment where um, Homer is sort of showing, look at all these other stories, look how the story that I'm telling connects and is part of our larger mythology, our larger um, uh, uh, belief system. So it's a moment of really Homer showing how this individual story of this one man is part of a much larger reality, a much larger system of belief. Odysseus then comes across three of his uh, former comrades in arms. First, Agamemnon, and we once more get the story of Agamemnon's death um, at the hands of his wife and her lover, this time from Agamemnon himself. And he says to Odysseus, So I died a wretched, ignominious death, and round me all my comrades killed, no mercy, one after another, just like white-tusked boars, butchered in some rich lord of power's halls for a wedding, banquet, or groaning public feast. Think about the irony, being killed by his own wife and her lover as though for a wedding. They are the, the meat, the slaughter for his wife's second wedding. And Agamemnon, as you might expect of someone who's been murdered by his wife, says, okay, I don't think Penelope's gonna kill you, but be careful when you get home. Don't tell her everything. Don't trust your wife fully. You need to be aware. So Agamemnon ex uh, uh, expresses his own wisdom or his own perspective to Odysseus. And again, think about what role does Agamemnon's story play in the story of Odysseus? How does it serve to um, enrich our understanding of Odysseus's story? And how might this affect Odysseus himself, hearing what Agamemnon says? How might this affect what he will do in the second half of the book of the poem when he reaches home finally. After Agamemnon, Odysseus sees Achilles, um, who of course was the hero of the Iliad and the most glory-seeking, valiant, violent, powerful warrior of all the Greeks. And again, Homer's brilliance in that he can so subtly undercut the heroic ideal that at other times he praises and holds up by showing that Achilles, the greatest warrior of all, would give it all up if he could only be alive. 
By God, I'd rather slave on earth for another man, some dirt poor tenant farmer who scrapes to keep alive, than rule down here over all the breathless dead. So what has Achilles' quest for glory ultimately gotten him? Well, nothing but death and nothing but a wish to return to life, even the most humble life of all. And Achilles asks after his father and his son. Um, Odysseus doesn't know anything about what's happened to Achilles' his father, but he does say, I have seen your son. He was glorious in war and he went home unharmed. Of course, given what we've seen of what's happened to Odysseus, given what we've seen that happened to Agamemnon, given Achilles' own situation, um, how much faith can we put in that story? Uh, how much stock can we put in the glory that Achilles' his son won for himself in battle? We get another tragic moment as Odysseus comes across the third of his former comrades, great Ajax, the one who had committed suicide after losing in his dispute with Odysseus to get Achilles' armor. And Odysseus tries to speak to his friend and make amends, but Ajax refuses. He is still consumed by anger, even in death. So another um, tragic, poignant moment where we see the limits of heroism and the heroic ideal. Ajax's anger and pride had led him to kill himself, and even after death, he cannot reconcile with Odysseus, and Odysseus can never get his friend back. We see another group of dead um, including a number of uh, famous figures that are tortured by the gods for various um, wrongs they committed in life. Titius and Tantalus and Sisyphus. Tantalus and Sisyphus are quite famous um, and their stories are repeated uh, again and again in uh, literature after Homer. So pay close attention to uh, the nature of their punishments. Um, and then in an odd moment, he speaks with the ghost of Heracles even though he says that Heracles himself is immortal and is with the gods. So how exactly is it that Heracles is both, has a ghost in the underworld, but he himself is on Mount Olympus? Homer doesn't answer that. Um, this is perhaps a moment where Homer is taking two different stories from different mythic traditions and just combining them together and saying, yeah, well, his ghost is in the underworld, but he's up in, in the heavens with the gods. That's just the way it is. Um, it doesn't exactly make sense. Homer just sort of asserts that that's what's going on. So a few questions about Book 11. How does Homer's vision of the underworld compare to other cultural ideas about death? So you might compare it to Christian notions of heaven and hell, both modern Christian understandings of heaven and hell and earlier understandings, earlier stories about what it meant to what, what happened after death. And how does the depiction of the underworld and the life after death challenge the values of the heroic ideal? How does it undermine um, the sense that one's duty in life is to be heroic or show the limitations of heroism. And again, think in particular about the experiences of Achilles and Ajax. And what does Odysseus learn in the underworld, both literally and figuratively? And how does this journey change him? This is really a, a very important book in the poem and in the tradition of Western literature, because it is this journey to the underworld that serves as the model for all future uh, similar such journeys, whether they are literally journeys into the underworld or figurative journeys, as you see in many stories where people go underground. Um, you might think about in in uh, Star Wars Empire Strikes Back when Luke goes into the cave and confronts uh, uh, a vision of Darth Vader that turns out to be himself. Um, that's modeled on this. This is the the classic story of the journey into the underworld. Um, so how does it change Odysseus? And compare this to other stories that you've read where similar sorts of quests take place. How do they draw on what Homer presents us with here? And finally, we get to book 12, the cattle of the sun and the midpoint of the poem. 
Odysseus returns from the underworld to Circe's island, and she says, there are a number of dangers that you're going to experience. Um, there are the sirens who try to bewitch sailors with their song, and so they will sail their ships into the rocks and drown and die. So you have to be wary of them. There are the clashing rocks, these rocks that literally just smash together, that if you try to pass through them, they'll destroy your ship. And then we have the uh, the famous pair of Scylla and Charybdis. On the one side, there's Scylla, a monster that reaches down and grabs up sailors from the ship and eats them. But So if you sail too close, she'll get you. If you sail too close to Charybdis on the other side, it's a whirlpool that will suck your ship into the depths and destroy it. So the proverbial rock in a hard place, we might say. And then, of course, the cattle of the sun themselves, the island of Helios, where his sheep and cattle graze, that if you kill and eat them, you will be punished for violating his property. So first we get the siren song. And as they prepare, as they get near the island, Odysseus gives uh, all his men wax to put in their ears so they won't hear the song and be tempted by it. But he straps himself to the mast so that he can listen to the sirens without being tempted or without being pulled off course. And he hears them. Come closer, famous Odysseus, Achaea's pride and glory. Moor your ship on our coast so you can hear our song. We know all the pains that the Greeks and Trojans once endured on the spreading plain of Troy when the gods willed it so. All that comes to pass on the fertile earth, we know it all. So they sent their ravishing voices out across the air, and the heart inside me throbbed to listen longer. So Odysseus is able to hear the siren song, but since he's strapped to the mast and his men just keep rowing, he's not uh, destroyed by the temptation. They then pass through the twin dangers of Scylla and Charybdis. And of course, six of his men are snatched by Scylla and eaten. And Odysseus says this is actually the saddest thing that he's seen out of all the horrors that he's seen. This one pains him the most for some reason. Um, and they make it past Charybdis as well. And then they get to Thrinacia, the island of Helios. And he says, let's just keep sailing. Let's not land there. It's too dangerous. But once more, we see Eurolochus return. And he says, look, we're hungry. We're tired. We need to stop. And so he rallies the men and they demand that Odysseus stop on the island. Since he's outnumbered, doesn't want to risk a mutiny, he says, okay, but let's not eat any of the cattle, any of the livestock. Let's stick to our own food. He warns them not to kill the sheep or cattle, but of course they defy him. Their food runs out and they defy, uh, uh, again, at the behest of Eurylochus, the prompting of Eurylochus, they decide to kill and eat some of the sun god's livestock. And Eurylochus says, listen to me, my comrades, brothers in hardship, all ways of dying are hateful to us poor mortals, true, but to die of hunger, starve to death, that's the worst of all. So up with you now, let's drive off the pick of Helios's sleek herds. I'd rather die at sea with one deep gulp of death than die by inches on this desolate island here. Perhaps that's a good argument. Perhaps it would be better to just drown and die immediately rather than starve to death over a long period. Or perhaps Eurylochus is just being, um, is not, is being impatient and they're being foolish. It's hard to say. But they make the decision to kill and eat some of his livestock. As has been foretold by Tiresias and Circe, Helios is not happy about this. And he complains to Zeus and says, if you don't let me get revenge for this, I am never going to shine on the earth again. I'm going to go bury myself in the underworld. And Zeus says, no, 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 don't do that. I'll punish them. I will destroy their ships as punishment because they have wronged you. So when they set sail, Zeus does what he says, puts a storm on them. The ships are destroyed. They're, they're uh, cast back to Charybdis and they're sucked into the whirlpool and everyone drowns except for Odysseus. And he manages to survive by hanging on to um, some of the wreckage of his ship, drifts for nine days, and on the 10th day, arrives at Calypso's island. And now we're, the narrative has been brought full circle. We're back to where we started with Odysseus's 
journey. So a few questions about book 12. Why does Odysseus want to hear the siren song when his men can't? And what does this, again, say about his character, about what it means to be a hero? Why has he allowed this to experience this temptation? And is this a positive or negative thing? Is this a positive uh, uh, trait of heroism or a negative trait? Um, once more, we see Odysseus's men defy him. And again, are they defying him with good reason? Are they being foolish? What's important or meaningful about this? How does this um, event uh, uh, continue to develop the theme that we've been seeing of Odysseus's conflict with his sailors. And finally, what do Helios's reaction and the actions of Zeus say about Greek understanding of the gods, right? How do the gods' concerns and desires conflict with those of humanity? We've seen repeatedly that the gods and men seem to be at odds and that the gods' morality is not the same as that of human morality. So how does this, again, continue to develop that idea and that conflict? And what does it tell us about the way the Greeks understood the world to work and what it meant to be a human in a world governed by these strange and often petty great divinities? Some final questions con to consider about these six books and the first half of the poem as a whole. How do the women, divine and human, in the second six books compare to those of the first six books? And again, thinking about um, Homer's portrayal of gender, the way Homer shows us what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be a woman, how men and women related, what their respective roles were in Greek society, and how these gender differences structured Greek life. Uh, think about Odysseus's adventures, particularly those in books 9 through 12 when he's telling his story of how he got to where he is. How do they compare to what happens to his son Telemachus in books 1 through 4? The kinds of people they meet, the receptions that they receive, the dangers that they face, and so forth. Um, and thinking about the dangers that Odysseus faces in his travels, the various monsters, the, um, the kinds of uh, uh, traps and so forth, what might be symbolic or meaningful about these different th threats? That is, think of them not just as literal monsters or creatures, but what do they represent? Um, how do they, again, work to poetically represent what it means to be a human in a hostile, strange world? How do the events of these books and the actions of Odysseus and others, including Agamemnon, Achilles, Ajax, um, how do they further develop and complicate the notion of heroism and the heroic ideal, showing us both what it means to be a hero as well as the limits of heroism, the problems that arise from the uh, relentless pursuit of glory and martial valor and victory? And finally, think about the external stories, that is, the stories of Agamemnon, the stories of Aphrodite and Ares, the various things that are, that are told that are not included in the narrative of Odysseus itself, um, but which of those seem important? And how do these tales, these interpolated tales from outside of the narrative, and again, this can also include the, the stories that we see in when Odysseus visits the underworld, how do they reflect upon, contrast with, or develop the story of Odysseus? What do they mean to Odysseus himself, and what do they mean to us as we read about and try to understand what's happening to Odysseus? Okay, finally, what is next for you? Um, first, uh, make sure if you haven't already read, read them, read books 7 through 12. I encourage you, if you have the time, to reread them or at least review the highlights. Um, you've got an online quiz on these books that's due Friday at midnight. Um, the reading journal for this week is also due Friday at midnight. And for those of you who are at the A and B levels, remember that the first writing assignment is due Saturday at midnight. 
Um, so get started on that. Uh, make sure to read those prompts and start thinking about those and reviewing those at the beginning of the week um, and working on that assignment for Saturday night. And finally, begin reading books 13 through 18, which will be um, the first half of next week. And we'll finish up the Odyssey as a whole next week also. If you have any questions, you know how to contact me, email, phone, text, Blackboard. Um, and otherwise, feast and be merry, sing your songs, enjoy yourselves, and good luck with your work this week.